<laughs> no question. Macho Man Randy Savage. Hated Hulk Hogan. He always won. Made me sick. <laughs> Love the Macho Man. That was my guy. It's Rowdy Roddy Piper. Oh, and you like Roddy Piper? <laughs> Obviously. Like the villain. Oh, wow. So I got the name from. Yeah. Really? Nice. Yeah. Nice. I want to be the Macho Man. <laughs> Change my name. I, I didn't even know that was loud. We could just take fucking wrestling names. <laughs> I didn't know we could. Okay, I'm taking the Macho Man. You can change it. I'm taking the Macho Man. I call Macho Man. CM Punk though could be my my, my new age favorite. How cool is he? He's amazing. Yeah. I wasn't until we watched uh, Old School Raw the other day. Yeah. Oh fuck! I missed it. It was. That's the one thing I wanted to see. It was cool, huh? It was really cool. It was really and then they, old, old. all everybody came Ric Flair was like the first one that like came out in the beginning. <laughs> the, woo, they yeah, had the, all the four horsemen. Saturday on HD Net. Or H, that HD yeah, channel. Universal HD. Universal HD. Yeah. Okay, I will. Yeah. Man, I didn't want to miss that. That's the one I, I try to always catch those. I don't want to spoil it for you then. <laughs> was it good? <laughs> Tell me what happened. Well <laughs> <laughs> So Rowdy Roddy Piper came out. He still and, fights. He's, yeah, he's he looks good. He looks like really good. And um, so he came out, and then the shield like interrupted him, and then like we're like really really rude to him. And then and CM Punk came out and defended Rowdy because that's when I was like, that's like a zero. That, yeah, now now oh, I was like yeah. CM Punk's the man. That's it. That's it. He oh, came out and defended God. Rowdy. <laughs> Love him. Like, he comes out wearing a he wears like a Gracie hoodie sometimes. Yeah, he does. I he see comes that. to a lot of the fights. I mean, he's yeah. we met him at the fights. Yeah, yeah. He's a big UFC he's fan. a big fan. Yeah. 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 He's a super Did fan. you see when him and Brock fought at WrestleMania? They were doing jujitsu. CM Punk threw up a triangle, then Brock did like a kimura, and then he got out. Then CM Punk did like a. Uh, uh, like an omoplata, and mm -hmm. then like he got out, he's like an arm bar, it was like crazy. It's just like a two minute grappling sequence. I love it, I love and it. And then Brock just picked him up and threw him out of there. Like, yeah, enough of this shit. <laughs> Brock just like lifted him off the ground and just like launched him halfway around the ring, like, okay, enough of this grappling. I got it in sports for a reason. Uh, it's cool to have like, you know, those kind of venues where like, you know, professional wrestling and stuff like people that. People see that. Yeah, people see jujitsu and they understand mm -hmm. grappling and like, yeah. you know, that fan base is becoming so much more educated because mm -hmm. of them. So, I yeah. love it. Shane has yeah. been educating us. Oh, yeah. Uh, she's been oh. down for years. Oh, she, she, she will sit there. She, she will sit there in the chair like this. I put up this one, like, uh, Instagram video of her doing it and she's trying to teach Edmund about it because Edmund walks in and he's like what the fuck is this Ada? This is bullshit. <laughs> da, 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 da. and so she's sitting there in the, the armchair like this with like I don't know if it was like some sort of bounty hunter hat like a okay. bounty hunter hat I don't know what she was like a crocodile Dundee hat <laughs> and she has like the keyboard in her lap she's like well, so this is what's going on right now, and this is why these two are fighting. Da, da, da. And then Edmund's like, yeah, whatever. And then you look and look at him. He's like leaning forward, and he's like, and then why are they doing this? Like he gets Let's like. Let's go do some striking. Uh, yeah. this shit. <laughs> well, that's also because she and Josh Barnett, you know, trained together for so long, and Josh, you know, with his big wrestling background, like they've done a lot of stuff together. Like we have some fun. when they were she was fighting a long time ago, and she's pulling moves on Josh and doing all these wrestling things. And yeah, it's fun. It's cool. It's yeah. like a, it's like a live stunt show because it's like after like doing like fight scenes and stunts, like these people are taking like real bumps. These are all real, it hurts so bad. Very difficult moves to do. It hurts bad. I tried it. Yeah. yeah. I tried it. I thought about going to WWF. Yeah. I promise you. After yeah. the Olympics in '04, I went to a couple shows too. Yeah. What but then I went to keep wrestling. I don't know. I didn't get that far into it. King Mo actually went to the the training camp before he even started doing this. I stopped right before that. Because I was too afraid. I was like, man, this hurts. Like, they slammed you in the ring. I went to TNA Wrestling way back in the day. And uh, me and Joe Williams got to walk down the, the ramp. And then they they did a couple of mm -hmm. body slams. And he's like, you got to throw your arms back. And I was like, man, this hurts. I'm done. I was like, I'm not doing professional wrestling. Sir, uh, DC was talking about a time that you went, stayed with him in Stillwater, trained with, with the guys over there. Can you talk about that? Because that sounded pretty... Uh, Pretty crazy um, time. <laughs> yeah, that was an awesome experience. I got to train with a lot of the guys that were like NCAA champions, all Americans. Um, and John Smith is personally my absolute favorite coach ever. So I was so excited to get to work with him. Like literally everything that came out of his mouth was gold to me. <laughs> so. Sarah was that to me. <laughs> Sarah was that to me. <laughs> and and taking on somebody like like Rhonda, you guys are both 
Olympic athletes. This is different than just regular fighters. Can you talk about what makes it different? Um, the fact that both of us have been doing it for such a long time at such a high level, you know, it, it changes things. Like uh, some of the girls, you know, it, they've been getting into it more in the recent years, like, you know, five to maybe 10 years ago, but I've been training for in wrestling and MMA for 19 years. You know, I'm sure, I don't know exactly how long Rhonda has, but I mean, it's pretty extensive. And so uh, it just changes the level of our capabilities. Rhonda, how do you feel about that too? Because, you know, this is, this is a woman that's been just like you, competing at a high level since she was a little girl. Um, I, I think it, it's an amazing matchup, and an, it's great for not just women's MMA, but MMA in general. I think this is probably the first time in history. Have we ever had two undefeated? No. Um, Olympians, never. But uh, have we ever had even two undefeated people fighting for the title? I don't know about that. I don't think, I don't so. think so. We have two undefeated fighters. Both not just Olympians but Olympic medalists fighting each other. I mean, this is women's MMA has almost skipped ahead of the guys in the, hey. this one a little bit. Sorry. I'm Sorry. sitting here. I'm sitting here already. You know, like, enough. I'm sitting here and the only guy without a freaking Olympic medal. Like, what the hell? Is this? I'm like the odd person. Out. I'm the only one without a damn medal. You can bring that shit up. That's why you got moved to the co-main. I'm right in the middle. Oh, wow. Right in the middle. Just saying, you know, Beijing Team 08 still undefeated oh in all of them, right? Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Don't, come on, let me talk up the ladies a little bit. Go ahead, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Go ahead, go ahead. So, yeah. <laughs> For both Sarah and Rhonda, you are in that position where you're trying to establish female MMA and it's this new thing in terms of the UFC, but you get to get that one up on the guys, you know, being the first two Olympians to ever fight in Octagon. Wow, is it the first two Olympians or? Yeah. It's the first time that two Olympians are being knocked on. Yeah, so yeah, with just all those factors combined, I'm like, Olympians, Olympic medalists, undefeated for the championship. We've never had that many factors come together for the UFC championship, and it just really speaks to what, how far MMA has come in general. You know, they used to just t be kind of sold as these are two guys that they, they picked up from outside in the bar, and then they gave us some extra money to fight in front of some people, and now it's just like the athletes that get to the absolute epitome of their sport are now, you know, moving over into MMA and being successful. And they, why are they being successful? Because we're using our Olympic sports. This is not, you know, brawling or, you know, human cockfighting like people call it. Like, I walk in there and I pretty much do exactly what I did representing my country in the Olympics for doing. And she goes in there and she does exactly what, you know, what she learned to, to do for her sport. And there's nothing barbaric or anything about that. We're celebrated for what we do in one arena and we're criticized for it in another. And I really feel like this um, bringing the whole relation to the Olympics into it kind of softens up the look of MMA a little bit more. And people are going to look at us more as athletes not just fighters. Sarah, can you come out on the same thing? Um, I agree, and I think that the same thing is with um, like boxing and Muay Thai, you know, like some people have it as like, oh, it's just this barbaric show, but the, the level of skill that you need to be, you know, an excellent boxer or, you know, Muay Thai fighter is unbelievable, and it's called like the, in boxing, it's called the sweet science, you know, like the amount of technique that you need is, you know, it takes at least a decade of work to put in, you know, and it's not like two guys just getting out there trying to smash each other or two girls. And then, so, I mean, people I think are starting to get an idea of how much we dedicate our lives to this. What's your guys' relationship, you and Rhonda? Like, have you guys met each other before? Is this the no. first time? We're... I have never even got to meet before. No. This is the first time. You lucky dog. You, get to <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys seem like, you, you know, there's no animosity. This is like a test of skills, I guess. Well, it's different, I think, whenever um, you have respect for the person you're competing against. I, I don't think it changes how you will compete, you know, but I've competed against Olympic medalists. I've competed against, competed against world medalists and champ champions, as has Rhonda. And you know, like you have a certain degree of respect for the people who've put in the work that you've put in. So, you know, it's a it's a little bit different than somebody who you who, you know, maybe has only done it for a little bit of time. Like you don't feel like, oh, you know, like they deserve my total respect for that. What do you think, Brenda? Uh, well, I've been uh, following Sarah's career from the very beginning. We pretty much started at exactly at the same time, and I always thought that this would be the perfect fight to really bring up, you know, in, mm -hmm. in a big venue. 
And um, I think this is the perfect time for everything to be coming together. And um, I couldn't be more excited to have like an athlete of Sarah's level to really um, test myself against. And, and uh, it, it, it helps all of us, you know? It, it can't be like, oh, it's just one Olympia in the division that gotta jump on everybody else. And it's just, um, it, it raises the whole level for everybody. And um, I mean, I, I, I couldn't have a single bad thing to say about her, you know? She's practically Saint McMahon. You know, <laughs> Saint McMahon who was, you know, the... Not the, unless you see me before I drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, it's... it's mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like, well, wait for the right time, man. Don't push it, okay? I want it to be natural, all right? It's like forcing them together, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Never mind, I wasn't going to say that, whatever. Okay, so... Um, you, you broke up my thought. I was going somewhere with that. Well, Olympians are a proud bunch, right? And you guys get to basically be representing your individual Olympic sports in this kind of pancreation, you know, mixed martial arts style fight. Are you really going to be bearing that torch of judo and wrestling? I mean, we're technically we're, we're teammates already. You yeah. know, we were both at the 04 games. And so it's just like, you, um, what was like the one thing they always put Olympian news? You're always an Olympian, never former, never past. And so it's something that um, I think. Yeah, I, I don't want to speak for them, but it's something that you carry with you your whole life. It's something that you always have pride in, and you always have respect for the others that have reached that goal as well. Yeah, we both, like, all of us were contributing towards our country's medal count, and that's something to be extremely proud of, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, we were competing. <laughs> oh, sorry. You guys are killing me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, like, at one point, you know, before we ever even knew each other, we were striving for the same goal in our individual sports. But in terms of the actual style matchup of a oh. fight, you know, it's wrestling, right? uh, oh. sorry, wrestling versus judo. I, I personally feel, even before this, that um, really you can't, it's not at a point where you can really pit like one sport against another sport because there's so many individual factors that come into play. So, like, I don't feel like any person carries wrestling or judo or boxing on their back. It's, you know, this boxer might be this judo person, but this judo person might be that Muay Thai guy. And, like, you know, there's so many different factors that it really is individual matchups. And for all three of you being Olympians, at what point do you get in your career and start to feel like a fighter? You know, because it's different than just competing as, as an athlete. Uh, I mean, I always felt like a fighter as a judo player. Like, there would be a lot of times where I was in, in matches and the person I was fighting was kind of playing to points a little bit, and they would just kind of get ahead by a little score and then run away the whole rest of the time. And I wouldn't even be in the fight at that moment. I'd just think, I was like, this was a real fight, I would kill you. You know, and I would always t tell myself that I was the best fighter in the world, even if, you know, not every judo match would go my way. So I always thought of myself as a fighter even back then. And when I started hearing about MMA, and there's like, okay, so the referee doesn't really get involved until the end, and you get unlimited time on the ground. Like, this is really the rules of what this is, it, you know? And so um, I, I, I never thought of, I'm a fighter now that I do MMA. It was like, oh, now that I'm in a different sport that has more rules, I can express more of the, you know, what I have to offer as a fighter, as opposed to like within a sport that has so many like regulations in it. It's just you're so tied to the sport that you did your entire life that you're always, I'm always going to be a wrestler. Like, I'm a wrestler first more than anything. But, uh, you know, as Rhonda said, you know, you fight. I mean, I used, I used to get in fights all the time in wrestling. Like, I'd fight on the mat and I'd fight in practice. So you, it's just something in you. You know, you see those guys that come in and wrestle uh, and try to fight and they, they cower away from punches. You know, you know that it's that that it's that, uh, that fight or flight that's inside of you. And some people aren't fighters, you know, so you know it. The moment you go into a cage, it doesn't matter if you lose every time. You're a fighter. You went into that cage. Not everybody can do that, but wrestle first always. I agree with that, um, just because that's what I um, have the strongest ties towards. But um, <coughs> also, like Daniel was saying, that there are certain people that you know from your sport that you're like, they're going into MMA? Oh my God, like they just have a little bit crazier factor about them that you're just like, they are gonna love the expansion of the rules, you know? Like there's somebody who is like chomping at the bit to push the absolute limits of our rules and wrestling towards, you know, physical pain. So you're like, that's that's a mean guy or a mean girl. And I've encouraged some of the girls that I wrestled with that were like 115 or whatever. I'm like, you need to do fighting. You're really gonna like this. So I think it really is like kind of in you.
You bring up an interesting point, and I'd like DCU to comment on this as well. I've heard from certain coaches, they say that women are more coachable, maybe because you guys go in there saying, I have a lot to learn, I'm not, I'm not a guy you know, who's just so much a guy who thinks I already know how to fight, but women can be more coachable and can learn faster, better than men. Do you guys agree with that? I've never been a man before. So. No, I know. <laughs> I don't see. Touche. Um, but, uh, but you see how men are. You, see, you train with men. You certainly know who listens, who doesn't. It's the ones that are successful are the ones that listen. Yeah. Whether you're a, a, a female or, or, or you're a guy. You know, it doesn't matter. The ones that are successful are the ones that are going to listen. Yeah. You know, you can you, you watch guys in fights. You know, you can tell that 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 Cain Velasquez listens to his coaches. You can tell that Ron and Sarah listen to their coaches because they're successful. The guy that goes off the beaten path, the guy that wants to do his own thing, that's the guy that's not going to find a success at the highest levels of the sport. You can get along pretty good. You can get to a certain level, but you will never, you will never cross into the, the, the you know through the stratosphere. You'll never get to where you really want to go if you're uh, that macho. You have to be willing to listen. So I may tell my coach, you know, as I do all the time, I cuss him, to hell with you and I leave. Well, you know, after about five minutes, I walk back like a puppy with my tail between my legs. Because <laughs> nobody's chasing you. It's your job. Yeah. And you're gonna get your ass kicked in the cage if you don't come back in here and learn. That's pretty much how it, that's what it boils down to, man or woman. I've heard that the women are more appreciative, you know, like, and I think that being around a lot of females and more of a male dominant sport, which with wrestling and with fighting, that the girls come back and they're like, thank you so much for working with me. I really appreciate it because, you know, a lot of attention is diverted towards the guys mm -hmm. whenever, before women became a little bit more popular in wrestling and in MMA. So it was some, them taking time out of their schedule to individually teach you. So, which the guys, it was, it's sometimes a little bit more expected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you're already preparing to make this jump up to the main event. You headlined it in Victa, but in terms of the UFC and the media monster and everything you have to deal with leading up to your title challenge, how are you preparing for that? Um, I, I guess in my mind I just expected it to be really similar to what I experienced for the Olympics, which is we were the, the first team for the Olympics in 2004, so uh, we received a lot of attention to help our sport, so it was like a constant barrage. Like I couldn't even sit down and eat a meal without, you know, having reporters there. Like they just, outside of our training time, it was kind of packed with interviews and we were all like, okay, we have to do this because this is helping our sport. But um, it was wearing, but now I think the second time around, it's just gonna be a little bit easier because I know what to expect. Sarah, can you talk about what did you see in Ronda's last fight and the way that fight uh, was decided? What, was your, what were your thoughts about it? What, I, what are my thoughts about it? About well, it wasn't decided. It, <laughs> it was finished. So, um, uh, no, I thought that was a really good fight. I think uh, both women prepared for the fight very well and for their, their matchup. And um, I think that you could see with the intensity and the passion that both of them fought that they really were leaving everything out there. And I think that that's what does the most justice for the MMA fans is two people that are willing to go out there and put everything on the line and, you know, walk out of that cage with no regrets. Can somebody avoid to be armbarred by Ronda Rossi? Is it what? Can somebody survive the armbar? Well, I'm pretty sure a lot of girls in judo did it. I mean, unless she <laughs> finished every single match by that and won the gold every time she competed. So the same with me, though. Like, People have defended things that I do well. It, every athlete is beatable. Every athlete is, you know, has weaknesses, and myself is included in that. Did you think Misha had a good strategy, though? Um, it isn't the strategy I would have used. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> you see, are you relieved that you don't have to fight five rounds because the women stepped up in the middle of that? You know, I got, I got asked if I was upset, and I said, no, I think you just gave me the best news that I've gotten in a long time. <laughs> really, because just with the whole f first time down to 205 and everything, I would much rather fight in a three-round fight than a five-round fight. And, 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 you know, to be, to be on a card with, with, with two ladies that are, that are Olympians, Olympic medalists, you know, during the Olympic Games, mm -hmm. the Winter Olympic Games are going to be going on. And, uh, yeah, it was, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about the fight that I have because I think the guy's tough. 
But, uh, you know, just to be fighting on the same card as two girls that I, I went to the Olympic Games with, uh, Ronda and I twice, um, yeah, it's a big deal, you know. You, 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 Earlier you asked Ronda about, you know, it seems like there's no animosity to more, towards Sarah. You got to kind of go back in history and look at her, her career before just her last fight or the two fights with Misha to understand that there's never any animosity to, between Ronda and the other person. You know, you have to understand that first and foremost, you know, she's an Olympian. She's going to carry herself with dignity, and that's what happens unless somebody just really brings it out of you. You know, and that's what that's what happened in the last fight. So you don't you don't expect her and Sarah to be barking at each other. These are two f women that have have done things that most people can only dream about, and that's why this is the fight. This is the fight that we've all. I mean, she came up to the set the other day, and I said, I'd love to see you fight Sarah at some point. And she goes, You know what? That's the fight I want because she's a competitor, just as Sarah is. So it's gonna be a good fight. Yeah. You guys have fun. Five rounds. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy enjoy, enjoy practice. There. Enjoy practice. <laughs> enjoy practice. Because it's not even the fight. It's practice. Yeah. It's every day going into the sparring room and knowing that you've got to fight hard. And when you go, a half an hour is going to pass before you go to, back to the other room. You're going to be in there by yourself for 30 minutes with however many guys you have to spar with. So, yeah, I'm you, very happy. You said something interesting, DC, uh, while we're eating, about the fact that when they, these two match each other up, she's going to feel different. Sarah's yes. going to feel different mm -hmm. than Ronda's other competitors. And the, Can you explain that a little bit on camera? Because I think that's a really yeah. good point. Well, for Ronda, it's like when Ronda fights, like when Ronda fights, it's almost like the, 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 it's almost determined because I know that these girls don't have what it takes to beat a, a lifetime athlete. Mm -hmm. Ronda says it herself. She said it last time. She goes, I'm a lifetime athlete, you wrestled on the, the boys' high school team. I mean, that's true. No truer statement was spoken through all the bickering and everything else. Nothing was truer than that statement. So when she feels Sarah, it's gonna, she's going to feel the, the type of power in the type of athlete that she felt in her judo competitions. It's not going to be like grabbing someone that you can just throw down. It'll be like, okay, now I'm grabbing someone that's on an athletic level that I am. I, I don't know how the fight's going to play out, but physically it'll feel different because now Sarah's base is going to be different because she's been wrestling her entire mm -hmm. life. As, as Sarah's going to feel with Ronda. Yeah. She's never competed against a girl like this outside of wrestling. You know, in MMA, Sarah's been fighting girls that she double legs them, she just throws them down. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a lot harder to do against Ronda yeah. because Ronda's an Olympian. These girls are lifetime athletes. I mean, I can't even remember... I mean, when did you start wrestling? When I was 14. 14. And when did you start competing judo? 11. 11 years old. These girls have been competing at the highest levels for over a decade, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be different. It's going to be good. I know when I'm done fighting, I'm going to go back and watch these girls fight. And you guys agree, yeah? It's going to be Oh, uh, definitely. Like, um, I'm absolutely positive that the... The way that I was able to throw Misha when she came in for those shots, it would not be possible to do that against her. Just because of the time that she's put in and the level of athlete she is and the technique that she has, I know that I would I definitely have to approach her as a, a completely different than Misha, even though though they both came from a wrestling background. The the level of Sarah's the, the level that she's at has to be she has to be approached in an entirely different way. There was a era when everybody was looking at you need a hub like a new sports role model, being a great soccer player. Mm -hmm. Then Danica Patrick, and I look like you are embracing this role of the next. They actually you are a new female sports star. How do you embrace? How do you, how do you uh, assimilate this mediatic impact that you are having in this sport? Um, you know, I just adjust according to what the situation is you know you adapt and survive regardless of what's going on and so um it's definitely um difficult to be under such scrutiny all the time but um just the one thing i really discovered is that people are going to be unhappy with you regardless and you're going to say thing at something at some point that people aren't going to like and you're not always going to be at your sharpest and you know um things aren't going to always come across right and you're not always going to be perceived in the right way and so once I accepted the fact that I was I can't make everybody happy and then I was just like okay well I might as well just not care at all at, with you know what's the right thing to say at this time and I was like I'm not a politician I'm not running for senate 
and and just accepting that I'd rather in, embrace being imperfect than trying to be perfect. It kind of um, uh, it makes it really acceptable for you to err because if you act perfect and if you're not perfect one day, then people will freak out. But if Natalie Portman said half the stuff that I do on a daily basis, people would freak out. But because I say it every day, it's like normal now. And so I'd rather um, have it be normal for me to say whatever than to be st to get myself stuck in you know a certain role that I carved out for myself. Rob, this is such a quick turnaround, eight weeks. Yeah. When we first approached with the fight, were you taken aback? And <laughs> how long did it take you? Were there any conditions? Uh, well, I, it was like three weeks before the fight. Uh, Dana calls me up and he was like, hey, what do you think about fighting in the end of February? And I said, well, I was thinking about having a little bit of a break because uh, I had, you know, I did two movies in a row and then went straight into training camp. And, um, but I was like, look, you know me, I will fight for you on 24 hour turnaround if you need me to, you know? Um, it's like, do you, if you need me for this fight, I'll do it. And then um, I was like, well, let me talk to my coach real quick. And so um, I hung up with Dana and I talked to Edmund and he was like, this is perfect, this is perfect. Call him up and say, we'll fuck up any bitch that he wants in February. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and so I didn't even know who I was fighting. I was just talking to him like, hey Dana, I will fuck up any bitch you want in February. <laughs> but let me handle this other bitch first. <laughs> and then I on the phone and then uh, went back to, to training camp for Misha. And I didn't mean that in a bad way. I say, yeah. I didn't know, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know how animated Edmund is when he speaks. And yeah. so he was just like, so like pumped into it. It's just like, not like, Oh, maybe we should do the fight. I don't know. I'm just like, fuck it, let's fucking do it. Let's go. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right. We're all excited about it. We're excited. Let's just do it. And so, um, and it's better too that I had such a long layoff that um, I, I want to fight back to back, you know. And then with the uh, structure that I had in judo, we would go to like the Europe tour, and we would have four weekends in a row. You do like four World Cups, you know. And we were used to always fighting kind of like in seasons, like in bunches. And it was also usually like uh, in the like late winter springtime and so it's actually mostly it's it's the format that I'm used to and um, taking 10 months off you know it, it does affect you like I, I definitely felt the effect of it in, in my last fight and I feel like I'm gonna be way better now that I'm fresh from the cage the last time. And Sarah how about you were you surprised one that you were asked that you have one fight and it was in April and there's been a bit of a layoff but also with the quick turnaround as well. Um, no I I wasn't surprised that I was asked because I just anticipated it from, I guess, whenever she decided to drop down to the weight class, I thought, oh, two Olympians, like, you know, even before that, they just, that's something that people would want. So I had been training all along, anticipating getting that phone call. Do you think there's any coincidence this is during the Sochi Olympics? No. Um, <laughs> probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Did you find out before December 28th or after? Uh, before. You did, okay, so you got a little bit of notice. Yeah. Well, you know, Ron, the speculation is that you were cramming another fight in because you were going to go do another movie or something. And before your fight with Misha, we were asking you about other things that you were, had lined up, and you were like, well, I can't really say. Uh, well, so is there anything that you can say you're doing after that fight? Well, um, my agent said that, he was like, look, I want to be you know, really respectful of what you do. I was like, I'm not going to say anything to you about movies right. at all until the 29th. You know, I will, I will say nothing. And so, like, he would hit me up sometimes. He'd be like, hi, just hi, nothing else, no, nothing nothing at all. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we sat down uh, once after the fight. And um, and we, we got to meet again. But he, um, I can't say anything other than I will be available after this fight. Okay. And whether I do anything with that availability, you know, is still uh, not decided. But um, I talked to Dana too, and I will have a little bit of, of time to. Write. You're not going to make me do another, you know, eight week turnaround right. after this one. <laughs> Jesus, that would be that would be intense. <laughs> but you know, I'll just saying, like you know, upping upping the ante for every single fight mm -hmm. and making everyone a little bit more difficult. I think um, not just with Sarah being such an amazing competitor, but doing such a quick turnaround. I think you know adds that little more of like you know. That little impossibility factor to it that really makes me motivated. Yeah. Sarah, obviously, Ronda has <coughs> so fantastic and it's a great job, but you, as a, a great, uh, distinguished athlete, also, do you perceive like some jealousy from other uh, female athletes, like uh, fighters? 
for the way most of the highlights are going to Rwanda based on her great accomplishments? Um, I don't. I don't think that the attention has gone. You know, just simply because of her accomplishments. You know, but you know, she has a certain way with the media that generates a lot of attention. And so, if other fighters wanted that, they would have to make the same sacrifices. You know, and they could have that. Like, it's not like Chael Sonnen. You know, waited around for people to tell him. There's certain people that you know just get the media's attention and. I don't think it's anything to be jealous of because if you want it, go out and take it. So, I mean, don't don't sit around and be jealous and say she gets this and she gets that because she's doing it. So just do it in my eyes. To that, did you watch the last season of The Ultimate Fighter? What did you think and is that something you would do? I actually didn't. Um, and, you know, Thank you. I, I, <laughs> I told everyone I knew, I was like, don't watch that shit. <laughs> well, um, I don't, as you guys probably already know anyways, I don't typically um, get involved in a lot of things going on, especially at my weight class. Like I, uh, my family time is my family time, but I, I had a, like, a lot of other things going on in my life. But had I not had some different things going on in my life, I would have, you know, and as a support, for women's MMA. Is that something you would be interested in doing if you were offered to go? I don't think that I would. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't want the time away from my family. I have a young daughter, and um, time is something that you just never can get back. And, you know, like if you want to propel yourself into, you know, after you're done fighting into a career in movies and things like that, it's very smart to do that. And it also changes your pay grade. You are just a higher level athlete. But since that isn't important to me, that my daughter is the biggest thing in my life, and that time with her is irreplaceable. So you can't put a price on it. So I'm not really interested in it. Sarah, we always hear guys talking about doing it for their kids, uh, you know, from the other perspective, from a mother's perspective. What does it mean for you to represent for mothers everywhere, being in this competition that, you know, people don't think mothers should be doing necessarily? Oh, um, I guess, I don't think that whether you're a mother or anything else, you should, you know, just box yourself in and limit yourself to any kind of role. I think that if you want to do something, you should do it, whether you are younger or older or whatever, you know, like if it's not breaking the law and you're not like, you know, kicking little puppies, you know, like there's no reason why anybody can't do the things they want to do. And, you know, I wouldn't want somebody to say, oh, now that you're a mom, you shouldn't do a sport. And that's what it is it's a sport so yes I'm not going out and beating people up in public because that probably should be frowned upon <laughs> but as you're doing it as a competition with established rules and a referee that you know helps protect the fighters then I don't really see that why anybody should have a problem with it what's your reaction to be up in this position as a normal contender fighting for a belt which is a life-changing opportunity for a lot of people um I don't know <laughs> I think about all those things in hindsight. <laughs> like, so really, I just keep my eyes on what do I need to do to train? What you know? What am I going through for practice today? And I just stay very focused. And I, I really try to live more in the moment and enjoy the process. And you never know what's going to come afterwards. I could turn around and it be very similar to what I'm dealing with now. Like after I went to the Olympics, the next day I woke up and I was still the same person. Still, you know, so. I mean, maybe it will be the same and maybe it'll be different, but I mean, that's for future Sarah to worry about. <laughs> Rhonda, why is this a fight that you want to do? It seems kind of like the opposite of the Tate fight where, you know, Sarah's coming off a win, there's no rivalry, you know, there's no editing that you could be put into a role as you had an ultimate fighter that you were not happy with. So, you know, what about this fight? Is it appealing to you? Uh, I think the how different it is is really what is appealing. I mean, you can't really, it's hard to sell the same thing over and over and over. And I think that um, because the dynamic of the fight is so different, it's much easier to get people interested in, in another fight so soon because um, if it was just pretty much this, the same product that you're trying to sell people twice in a row, I mean, it's, it's hard to get people excited about it. And I, I approach every single uh, fight differently uh, according to what I think is needed at the time. And I think this is the perfect fight that is needed exactly at this time. When did you find out that it was going to be Sarah? Um, I found out that night of uh, the fight. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Before yeah, the fight or after the fight? Uh, after the fight, because for some reason, I thought we were fighting in Canada. 
Like, I don't know why. Like, I thought, like, Dana's like, February in Canada. I'm like, oh, okay. I was like, Canada. I was like, and I initially thought that after, um, if, if Kat couldn't fight, that I would fight Sarah next. But then I was thinking, well, if it's in Canada, um, they might have me fight uh, Alexis because she's Canadian. But then um, when I heard it was Vegas, and I was like, oh, it's totally McMahon. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, it was just that night. So Was it when he unveiled the poster? Is that when you... At the press conference when he slapped it, he slapped it right That's, down. I mean, when I heard it was Vegas, and I knew for sure it was Sarah, but when he, when he slapped down yeah. the poster, that's when it was, like, official, but I already knew. Right, right. And, DC, what have they told you in terms of consequences of this fight? Obviously, people know you and John Jones have had your exchange of words. and You know, have they actually told you how close you could get if you beat Rashawn? Uh, not really. Yeah. It's just it's just keep on plugging away. I... I uh, there's a lot of factors, man. You know, like um, that Jimmy Manoa called and wanted to train together, and I, I've actually been kind of contemplating it because maybe I can help him beat Gustafson, and then I would rightfully fight for the championship. So uh, I think some things have to happen with Gustafson fighting as well as he did last time. I think he would probably get a championship fight first, but if I fight well enough, I you know, anything can happen. Nothing's promised in the UFC, and, and uh, if I fight well enough, I'm hoping that it, uh, it gets me a title shot. You know, I, I, you know, I, I just kind of think that my resume speaks for itself. You know, I've, I've won every fight I've been in. If I beat Rashad, that'll be. You've won every round. I've won every round I've been in. If I, if I beat Rashad, that'll be my uh, third UFC champion. That'll be my uh, fifth win in the top ten. You know, so my, uh, you know, most guys don't have to win that many times to get a championship fight. So hopefully, uh, my resume speaks for itself. DC, it's been a long time coming for 205. Ever mm -hmm. since you got into MMA, people thought you should be in this division. So what's it mean to finally get here and get an opponent like Rashad? Um, you know, again, you know, like with the weight cut in the Olympics, I was nervous. I was, I'm still nervous about it. There's, there's some, some, some anxiety there. But, uh, you know, I've done it the right way. I've gotten smaller physically. I've made my body smaller to where now I'm in, I'm in striking distance. And then to fight a guy like Rashad, I think it says a lot about what I've done so far, you know, because if you haven't done what I've done so far, you don't get to fight those types of guys. Those fights are reserved for the best guys. You know, fights against guys like Rashad Evans, you don't just get those. You know, you have to earn those fights, and I've earned those fights. And uh, it tells me a lot about what the UFC things that I've done so far and uh, where they want me to go. Because if I win this fight, uh, it's going to be very hard to ignore you know what I've what I've put on paper. You're always confident that no one can take you down. Do you feel that way about Rashad Evans? Yeah, I'm not going to get taken down. That's just I've spent a lifetime developing that skill, and I'm not getting taken down. And you know when I look at when I look at a fight against another wrestler, this is my this is this is how I approach it. In the sport that we all chose, I got to the top. People don't just quit <laughs> wrestling. You stop because that's the end of your road, whereas mine just continued to go. So in the sport that I chose, Rashad chose, John Jones chose, uh, and the rest of those guys chose, I went to the top of that sport. So, no, I'm not getting taken out. Can you talk about the fight of the girls? How, what kind of fight do you expect? Tough fight. I expect a, I expect a, a really good fight. I saw I, I saw Sarah compete against uh, some very good fighters and go to distance, so I know that she can go long. I saw something in Ronda last fight that Ronda's getting much better as a fighter. Ronda did some good clinch work last time. Ronda striking looked a lot sharper last time. Sarah striking looked sharper, and in her UFC debut, she just demolished a girl. You know, I mean, these are two of the best fighters in the world. M female, man, woman. You know, these are two of the best fighters in the world. And these two girls are going to go out and put on a show because they only know one thing. You saw, you saw her fight two weeks ago. She's going crazy in there. And you, you see, I've seen Sarah compete since 1999 is when I started watching Sarah compete. I know that these girls know how to compete, so it's going to be a hell of a fight. There's going to be a lot of flipping and flopping over there, <laughs> falling all over the ground, taking highly each other down to shit. Um, <laughs> highly technical, flipping and flopping. <laughs> throw her down, throw her down. Yeah, it's going to be fun. You, it'll be much different than what you're going to see in our fight. That's, that's one thing. <laughs> okay, let's go two more questions here, then we'll get Rhonda and Sarah face. <clears throat> I'm just wondering, based on your assessment of what you said of their skill set, it sounds like we're looking at number one and two for maybe for quite a while, right? I think I think they're the two best fighters. I really do think that overall they're the two best fighters because 
Again, I point to experience and competitiveness at the highest level. You cannot, there is no substitute. You can say, why well, wrestled in the NCAA championship? Well, you didn't wrestle in the Olympics. You didn't get a medal. You didn't get to stand on the stand and see your flag being raised at the Olympic Games. Not many people got to do that. Not only did Sarah do it in wrestling, which, which traditionally we're pretty good at, Rhonda did it in a sport that we don't normally do that well internationally. You know, so these girls have competed at the highest levels and, and you know, Sarah beat, the girl that beat her Olympics, she's the only person in history to beat that girl in a match. You know, so it's like these girls have competed at the highest level. I think these are the two best female fighters in the world, uh, regardless of weight division, regardless of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of organization or anything. I know, I know you had to say something about Cyborg, but uh, it's, these are the two best fighters in the world. For each of you, what do you want to say at the post-fight press conference after UFC 170, and what do you want Dana to say to you at that time? What do I want to say? Ooh, I don't know. It's my most incomprehensible moment. Was you know, if you asked me about the last fight, I didn't think I'd be talking about balls hanging from the ceiling. But, you know, that's, that's the subject I ended up on. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, what? You, you missed when Home and Garden came no, to what? crash the last <laughs> conference. <laughs> was talking about. That was hilarious. Yeah. So I have no idea what's going to come up with the press conference. I mean, um, what's kind of the ideal outcome? You know, what are you going to envision throughout camp to get through this? I don't envision press. <laughs> That's not the part that I'm thinking about like, in terms of the fight. Um, you know, I, I always prepare for just a five round war. That's what I prepare for. And I aim for the quickest and most efficient finish. And um, anything between those two, as long as it was me winning, I'm happy to talk about it after in the press conference. But um, that's what I'm envisioning. And um, I'm sure, you know, Sarah's singing something similar, but you know, I, I always say all the time that the person that you're in the cage with fighting is the person that you have the most in common with in the whole room. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, you two are both there fighting for that one thing because what the most important thing to both of you is the same thing. And um, yeah, I'm sure that'll come up. DC, oh me? Yeah. What would I what would I want to hear? <clears throat> You're fighting for the championship next. I'm selfish, bro. I want to fight for the belt. <laughs> Congratulations, DC. You're fighting for the belt next. That that would be perfect for me. But you know, if it doesn't happen, then I'll just go back to work and getting better. But congratulations, DC. You just earned yourself a title shot. Sarah, I uh, also don't really think about it. Um, I really just answer whenever I'm asked a question. Um, I don't really try to like premeditate any kind of response. So, um, really, like I said before, I try to just really live in the moment. So, I'll say whatever that moment brings. Nice. Right. Again, 170, oh. February 22nd, Mandalay Bay. Take your time. Second Hands up or? You can do the Macarena if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't you take any pictures? <laughs> Everybody good? Okay. She wears contacts. Your eyes are brown. I like opening it. Is this a fake one? No, it's a real one. Uh -oh. <laughs> I feel slider. I'm just getting stronger. <laughs>